Today's talk is not exactly about New World Magiscola, but it's about a design principle that we're using in New World Magiscola, and it's a little bit more theoretical than some of the stuff that we've talked about a little bit today, so I hope I'll be able to make it interesting. I'm calling it LARP bouldering, and if it doesn't make sense now, I hope in 10 minutes it will make sense then. So I started from two fundamental questions, one which you guys have been wrestling with and we've been wrestling with. How do you acclimate new players to your game? Players who've never maybe played in the Nordic style before. Um, if they have varying abilities and experience and styles and motivations, right? And that led to the question, how do you design a game so that every player, no matter their ability, their experience, their style, their motivation, can feel safe and that if they can find something engaging and challenging and empowering in the LARP, right? We want everyone to have a great game and we want everyone to be able to play. And so, you know, our first reaction was this. <laughs> Done. Um, but so we had a little bit of wine and we decided we would do it, right? And so we said, we have to take this crazy herd of LARPers that comes to our game, right? Like, this is your party, right? <laughs> and they're not all sheep. They're not a herd, right? They don't all pay attention. They don't all follow the rules. They sure as heck don't do what you tell them to do, right? One of them's going to be the llama, and they're going to spit, right? <laughs> and they're going to run away. But we have to deal with this, right? We have LARPers who come to the game, they're experienced LARPers, and they're looking for all the drama, right? And then we have brand new LARPers, and at New World Magiscola, we have about 30% of people who've never LARPed before. And we think that is fantastic. It also scares us, right? Because we have a huge responsibility, because we're the custodians of their experience. And so they also come to us with a variety of bodies, right, and abilities. So we have disabled players, and we have able-bodied players, and we have cisgendered and transgendered, and variety of sexualities. And all of these people need to be able to see themselves in the game and to find something for themselves in the game, right? And so I should have went back to the ha-ha-ha nope, right? But we kept going, right? And so there's some things I could pull from from education theory that sort of helped us with this design. And that's the idea here is that the fairness, right, is that we design the LARP and it's that tree in the background, right? And we tell all these players here, the monkey, the penguin, the elephant, the goldfish, and the bull, and the seal, that they have to climb the tree. Everybody do it, right? And it's fine, it's fair. They all have the same task that they have to do, right? Except that some of them uh, have different abilities than others. And the other thought here is this uh, notion here of equity and justice, right? Where some of our players aren't going to need any help at all, right? Some of them are going to need a little bit of help, and some of them are going to need a lot of help in order to be able to access this content, right? And so how can we do this? We're designing one game, right? And so we look to the concept of differentiation, which has been around for a good 30 years in education. And it's this idea that not everyone is the same, so we need to tailor the experience for the individual learners. And there's four things you can differentiate, right? You can differentiate the process, which in a LARP is how you play, right? You can differentiate the content, which is the world and the characters and the things, the plot. You can differentiate the product, which is what we want them to play, the genre, right? The world. Or we can differentiate the environment, and by that we mean the physical environment, but we also mean the emotional environment, right? So I can't, my LARP is not set in a 15th century castle, because they don't exist in the United States. <laughs> um, but also because, well, we can't take a 15th century castle and magic up an elevator, right? But we can also need to worry about the emotional environment. Do people feel that they're willing to take a risk, right? Because LARPing is risk. Last night, before I started to play Into the Line, I was ready to turn around and bail, right? Because I was frightened, and I'm an experienced LARPer, but you have a non-experienced LARPer, they're excited to come, and they're scared. All right, so some sample strategies we'll talk about later, but this is how you move through a LARP, right? I might be on the orange path, but I might jump over to the red path, or on the green path, but everybody's following their own path through a LARP. Not like the herd of wildebeests crossing the river. So, <coughs> metaphor. In education, we have scaffolding, which is this other idea that you build this little structure around your LARP, and you can take it away when people have mastered it. 
The important concept I want you to have from this side is this notion of zone of proximal development. Fancy term, right? Which basically means that there's a sweet spot where somebody wants to do something and believes they can do something and feels safe enough to want to do it. Okay? And so taking those things together and this idea, big word again, semiotic scaffolding, which means there's some signs that will help them get through it, we got this idea of LARP bouldering. All right, so the LARP is the wall, and you build the handholds and the footholds that go on the wall for the variety of players that are going to be there. It also lets you get in a little bit of cultural context, because in the United States, when you go bouldering, you have to wear a helmet, and you have to sign a waiver, and the wall can only be but so high, or else you have to have a harness, right? And then I went bouldering in Copenhagen, and... <laughs> challenges that helps you accommodate difference and gives opportunities for support because this could be the same wall right and the muscular experienced climber on the left is going to have access to handholds and footholds that the children on the, I got my lesson and rights mixed up the muscular climber on the right <laughs> And the children on the left there. And even the children on the left are different from each other, right? They're going to have different levels of moxie and comfortability and different levels of strength. And one of them maybe tried this before and fell off, and so they're a little nervous, right? And we have this at our LARPs, right? Because we have people who are brand new to LARP. We have people who are your uber experts and know everything, <coughs> and they will tell you. <laughs> and we have um, the people who are LARPers on the rebound, which um, they quit LARP for a little while, but now they're coming back, or they've just broken up with their old LARP, right? And they're <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's so many different cultures and styles that need to get across this wall, and they're not going to take the same path. So how do we build the handholds and footholds? So one thing we can think about is difference in support. So the LARPer on the left, has a harness and a helmet. And they are being supported by some others who are bearing some of the weight, right? And they're also being encouraged by the people around them and on the ground who can see things that they might not be able to see, right? If you've been on the bouldering wall, sometimes the next handhold is right there, but you can't see it. Either you can't see it literally, or you can't see it because you're stuck and you're scared. And so what you need is someone else to go to your right, to your right, reach up. If you reach up just a little bit more, you'll have it, right? And you're like, I can't, I can't. No, you've got it, right? And so we need to build those things into the design. So here's the text-heavy slide. Here are some ways we're trying to build these things into the design for New World Magiscola. So we're varying the types of characters that are written. Some people need a bare minimum of a character design, and then they want to go with it from there. Other people, that's paralysis of choice. Right? They don't have enough information, enough handholds and footholds. Relationship building before the LARP with character coaches. Some of you may have volunteered to character coach already. And if you haven't, I would love for you to. We'll give you five or so new players, and you can connect with them over social media and email and help walk them through the process of building a character and feeling comfortable. <coughs> little bits of teaser morsels, right? Where you lay out just a little bit of information that can help get you over the hump. Choices within limits, gender-neutral characters, which is something that College of Wizardry does, right? All of the characters for New World Magiscola are written in second person and non-gendered. But we've also modeled that in the world lore, where one of our house founders, founders is non-binary gender, and even in our unsoiled heritage, yes, unsoiled heritage is the new pureblood, um, there are families that are polyamorous and with same-sex parents, and other things that we're modeling so that it's not just given permission, but it's actively in the world, so that they're there for you to grip onto. And giving people the right amount of information that they need. Some people want all of the information, right? And they feel cheated if they don't have it. Other people need very little. 
So there's some examples there. And so here we are where we've marked semiotically some of the paths that are going across the wall. So start here. Take the yellow path, right? But then there are the people, they start in the yellow path and they get confident and they jump over to the orange path, right? And then you have the people like I always was growing up going, I don't want the yellow one or the orange one or the red one, right? I'm going to start over here and I'm going to go across my own thing, right? <laughs> and so you want to design that, is, that there are handholds and footholds that allow them to jump paths because sometimes people get the confidence 30 minutes into the LARP. So that's pretty much the idea of LARP bouldering and the kinds of ways that we're trying to build that in. And I hope that made some sense. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.